Thanks yes. for being here. Thanks for having me. So it's exciting to be here. I've uh, attended this event for quite some time, and uh, it's cool to be on the speaking end of it at this point. So let's get this uh, set up here, and we'll begin. Thanks. So as, uh, as Matt said, my name is Pete. I'm the uh, founder and CEO of a company called Hammerhead. And um, tonight I'm going to tell you six things that I have learned in my product development experience. So first, a bit of background about myself. I've been a cyclist my whole life. A few years ago, I actually biked across the United States, so New York to San Francisco. Um, that process took a very long time, 63 straight days on the bike. And doing that really gave me an intimate understanding of the fact that it's very hard to interact with data on a bicycle. So naturally, being a cyclist, this was a problem I set out to solve. And it occurred to me that on aircraft carriers, fighter pilots land planes on ships guided by light. So I realized we could probably apply the same philosophy to cycling, and that was what we did with our first product. So what we built was effectively a heads-up display for cyclists. It uses a series of light patterns. Uh, you see it here to communicate information to cyclists, show them turn-by-turn -turn directions, uh, real-time racing, and things like that in a way that's easy to understand, not distracting, and um, safe on the bike. It connects to your smartphone over Bluetooth. And um, what's interesting, though, is we've now finished the product development phase of this. So we've been through many versions of uh, prototyping. Uh, right now, we finished up the first manufacturing run. So I can really speak tonight, having literally just come out of it, um, to some of these learnings. And that's what I'd like to get into now. So the six key lessons. The first thing I'd like to reiterate is what makes hardware a little bit different from a lot of other companies, and especially the companies, our friends in the software space. Um, I'm assuming that those of you who work at so-called hardware companies here have a software component as well. So it's almost assumed that a lot of the challenges in software will be found um, and encountered by us. But naturally, shipping a physical product is governed by physical realities. That means everything that you know can go wrong is more likely to in hardware in the sense that you're subject to weather, international trade, all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and then there's this very specific and sequential process that goes into designing a hardware product. One has to design, followed by manufacture, followed by ship and fulfill. And the challenge with that is it's highly sequential. What you want to ship tomorrow first has to be designed, and that design process takes a long time. Manufacturing, it takes a long time. And each one of these things needs to take place in sequence. Next thing I like to say is that decisions in hardware are effectively set in steel in the sense that most of the time you're doing a product that has some injection molding element and when you do that you're effectively cutting your design into a steel tool. That process takes a lot longer than most of us would like. And once you've set that tool in motion and released tooling, you can't really revisit that too easily in a major way for a long time. So decisions need to be made sequentially, and then they often are set in steel or set in stone, if you will. Um, and the other thing that is worth pointing out with hardware is that it's static once produced. So a product that you envisage today and ultimately bring to market sometime in the future is unlikely to be able to be fundamentally changed um, during that process. So you set it in motion now and it, it arrives in the market sometime in the future. And that requires a more specialized team, which brings me to the five things we do about all these realities. The first thing I like to think about is defaulting to action. Um, a few years ago, I had an interesting experience. I took a class with um, General McChrystal at, uh, in college, and I remember asking him, you know, General, he was at that point recently finished um, commanding the forces in Afghanistan, and I said to him, you know, what's it like to uh, do something as complicated as leading the largest war effort in a generation. And, you know, how does that feel? And he, affected, he said to me, you know, you don't ever feel ready. You always feel slightly unprepared, you know, slightly afraid. And he said one other interesting thing. He said that the thing he's realized over his career, which at this point is almost 40 years, is that most of the other people in the room with him feel the same way. And when most of the other people in his case are people like the president and people of that caliber, I found that very reassuring to know that the fear I'm always used to in entrepreneurship, this fear of being not quite ready, whether that's ready to ship or ready to present at a thing like this, whatever the case might be, you're typically feeling a sense of, if only a little more time. Um, 
you know, the fact that he said that really, really resonated with me. And I think it, it comes back to the fact that if he feels that way, you will too. And you need to default to action when in doubt, do something. Um, that's always very important. Third, I think it's very important to concentrate innovation, especially in hardware. Um, now, the first thing, it's, it goes without saying that it's important to operate in a market that's large. Um, I think Mark Andreessen was the one who said that, you know, the number one killer of a company is the lack of markets. So, assuming you have a big market, the important thing to do then is focus your efforts. Don't try and do everything within that market at the same time. Now, in our case, we're first in the cycling markets. Um, we're not trying to reinvent everything within cycling at first. Uh, the fellows after me are reinventing the bicycle, so I'll let them talk about that. But we're focusing on something very specific first, which is the digital experience in cycling. And I think it's important to start small. It's expensive and hardware takes time, and you need to have a focused effort to do anything well. Um, I think it's important to do a few things well and then grow from there. I think uh, we can all remember Facebook started as something that many people at the outset thought was somewhat trivial, and at this point it's clear what it's, what it's become. The other point I'd make on this is one can, if one's clever about it, leverage software updates to re-update the hardware. And I think a company that does this fantastically well is Tesla. Because one is somewhat locked into this, you ship a product and the product is sort of what it is for a long time, it's great to be able to reanimate new features with firmware updates and things like that. So in our case, we focused on making that experience quite exciting. And once we ship to customers, they're able to open a product and then it effectively gets better over time. The fourth thing I'd like to say is one has to really anticipate, and anticipate more than one does in other fields of entrepreneurship in hardware. Now, in order to overcome the advantage of the incumbent, in order to truly tackle a big market, assuming there's someone else in it, which there probably is, your solution can't just be good, it has to be a whole lot better than the existing solution. And back to this sort of waterfall that needs to take place, you need to design something, manufacture, and fulfill. And that process typically takes anywhere from 12 to 24 months. And unfortunately, within that time, the market evolves. So a solution you might think of tonight or we might think is fantastic tomorrow is probably going to be facing a different market 12 months or 24 months from now, which means that in hardware one has to be anticipating that fact and designing something that is optimized for 12 or 24 months or however long it might be down the road. And that's obviously extremely difficult to do, but that is one of the things that goes with being a hardware entrepreneur. So your solution in that time still has to be better than the alternative will be by then, not what the alternative is tonight. Fifth thing I'd say is harness your insight. Um, all of us in this room, and in fact, everyone anywhere, is an expert at something. Now, all of those things are different. Um, you know, we all have different things that we know about, but we all know a lot about some one thing. And in my case, I've been a passionate athlete for a long time. A few days ago, I got back from New Zealand uh, where I did the Ironman. And it made sense for me to focus on a market of endurance athletics. And when one's trying to anticipate and have these insights that are necessary in, in hardware entrepreneurship, I think you need to give yourself every advantage that you can possibly take. And I think one of the natural ones to look at is what you know about right now. And I would encourage all of us to, to look at that. And the final category I'd speak to here is something I say, which is one has to be like Gore-Tex. And I'm sure we're all familiar with that material. It's quite remarkable because on the one hand, it's permeable to water, but it's not at the same time because water vapor can pass through it, but water solids cannot. And that's what one has to do with regards to advice and feedback. Um, one has to be selectively permeable. And that's challenging because, you know, we hear tons of feedback. I'm, I'll speak to some of you after this, and I speak to people about our venture all the time. And you hear everything from it's terrible, you know, our venture is stupid, to it's fantastic and it's going to change the world. And it's probably somewhere in between the reality. So my job and our job as entrepreneurs in the hardware space is to understand why that advice might be what it is, be resolute, and, you know, drive towards what you think is the truth, but be receptive and seek advice at the same time. I think one thing that's helpful to point out is the advice 
advice you typically get is, you know, advice from someone who's considering your solution in today's context. They typically aren't thinking about, hey, what would it be like in the case of virtual reality in a year or two when that's probably actually happening, you know? And I think that that's important to point out, especially in hardware, is that a lot of the feedback you get is in the context of today. So it can be both sound and irrelevant at the same time in a strange way. Um, final thing I'll say is I think it's really important to ask for help. Um, I think the fact that we're all in this you know, hardware community and attending events like this, listening to guys like me speak, um, is a testament to the fact that there's a real community of people who want to share and help each other. I think putting a great team around you is a huge thing and recognizing that typically someone somewhere has faced whatever question or technical challenge or whatever it might be that you are facing at that point in time. Typically, someone's seen that before. And you can think of your task almost as, you know, finding that person and just asking them what solution they came up with. So back to uh, our team. This is uh, my co-founder, Lawrence. He, uh, he's currently in China overseeing our manufacturing run. Um, this is Ravine Beam Singh, who's our head of software. And uh, this is where it all began. We started, we moved into a small apartment um, about 18 months ago in New Jersey where we prototyped, um, pre-sold this particular product in many countries and are actually shipping it right now. Um, so that's the shipping box that we're sending out. Um, that's the package that goes within it and that's the product in front of it. So it's quite an exciting time for us. And uh, today actually we signed our large scale plastics um, production release. So it's really actually right now. Um, and that's it. So I'll take any questions. It's great. So you are the, whether you did the Ironman? Uh, yeah, in New Zealand. I was there too. Yeah. <laughs> that's amazing though. Like, yeah. so you just flew back? I flew back a few days ago. Yeah. Wow. So, okay. So I'm glad to be done with that at this point. Yeah. That's a, <laughs> All right. And, and you shipping, which is a, uh, you know, quite, quite, you know, a, a huge milestone in, in this. I mean, yes. all, all yeah. the talk on like Kickstarter and all the things, and people actually building a product and then shipping is... Absolutely. It's daunting amazing. at so the same time. Congratulations so. <laughs> on, on both. Uh, questions? If not, I'd love to for you to uh, talk about the plans with, you know, the, what are you doing next? Sure. So um, our next phase, I mean, our first market is cycling. It's the product that you've seen now. Ultimately, I see us becoming much more of a digital sports platform. So you can see companies like Under Armour moving towards that. Um, companies like Nike with their running app, even Apple with uh, the new watch. So I see us playing in that space. Um, you know, as I mentioned, starting small and specifically, we're starting in cycling with this product. We'll probably move into running next. Um, that'll probably be in a year or two. Um, um, but that's sort of our, our horizon at this stage. I think there's a question somewhere, or maybe not. Uh, this might be a sort of cyclist's question. Have you looked at uh, the, the software behind navigation for cycling? Because I often find that's pretty ropey. Sure, yeah, it's, um, it's a very good question and something I hardly mentioned in the talk. Yeah, I mean, so the first, one of the first features we're building is a navigation element. Um, that's obviously not trivial at all. Um, a lot of companies are just building a navigation app and that's immense. So we face a lot of challenge with that. We're doing it both on iOS and Android. We uh, now have our app in both both stores and it works quite well. We still have some bugs that we're working out, but doing the navigation element has been challenging, especially in our case, optimizing it for cyclists. So guiding one onto routes that are, you know, safer, more pleasant to bike on and things like that. That's one of our elements. And then another piece is a social component. So being able to share routes, uh, meet up with friends, compete and things like that. So, but certainly the navigation part has been one of the most challenging aspects of our product so far. Okay, awesome. Okay, one last quick one. Probably need. Yes. Well, just to follow up on that previous question, uh, your clearly. The follow-up for the previous question, you're clearly using um, somebody else's product, Google's or Apple's product, and that's, that's sort of the base in terms of how the navigation is done. What are you doing to protect yourself from decisions that they will make in the future in terms of obsolescence, you know, copyright restrictions, et cetera, et cetera? 
So it's a good question. I mean, if one thinks about a mapping application, there are many different layers to it. And we're using, at this point, MapQuest is actually the routing algorithm that we're using. But um, the data is not from MapQuest. It's actually from a different source, OSM in our case. So if one looks at the stack, um, there are many different pieces within it, and each one of which is somewhat interchangeable at this point. In terms of uh, long term, what we're doing is building our own communal data layer on top of that. And what we envisage doing, and the real value we envisage creating, in the, at least in the, in the navigation space, is that communally generated data that we you know, generate ourselves and will ultimately own. So the challenge for us is to rely on existing data right now enough to have it be useful and compelling right off the shelf and then make it more so and increasingly you know with our with our data in the future so so it's really a question of I, I, I'm not afraid at this point because there are a lot of other things we could switch to but it's a good question great uh, that's uh, the time we have but uh, thanks very much for being here so thanks for having me uh, this is very cool thank you